Our scripture reading today comes from the book of Colossians. The book of Colossians, I'll ask you to turn there. I'm going to start at verse 20 of chapter 2 and read into chapter 3. Colossians chapter 2, starting at verse 20. This is the word of God. Let us give careful attention to its reading. If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, referring to things that all perish as they are used, according to human precepts and teachings. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. That ends the reading of God's holy and inspired word. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God abides forever. Let's go to him in prayer. Lord, once again, we have your word before us. We see it with our physical eyes. We've heard it read with these ears. Lord, by the power of your spirit who had the apostle Paul write these words centuries ago, we are asking that it would once again live and breathe in our own minds and hearts and be applied. Let us be those faithful hearers of your word that respond in cheerful obedience. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We're returning, as you can tell from the title of the sermon, uh, our walk faith, part two, we're returning really to this issue of union with Christ. By way of review, uh, I wanted to, to bring us up to speed. We have now looked, last week we read from Galatians chapter two, where Paul will, will say, I have been crucified with Christ and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me and the life I now live, I live by faith in the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. We've got that. We heard this morning another text that I will refer to shortly from Ephesians chapter two that still speaks of, of these odd, to us I think it sounds odd of this issue of being dead, of being crucified, of being raised, but I'll, I'll refer to that in a moment. And then once again, particularly in uh, chapter three of Colossians, these opening four verses, we see this great emphasis on life and resurrection. Let me just by way of review, put some of this. I tried to put it in something of a chronological order for you, just to, just to kind of speed through some of this, but just for you to realize how crucially important what we're talking about is for your living of the Christian life. It obviously, uh, Paul thought so, because it is repeated time and time again. But if we put this in, in something of a chronology, uh, Galatians 2.19 says, through the law, I died to the law. 
Colossians 2.20 said, with Christ or in Christ, I died to the elemental spirits of the world. Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified. This death language, Colossians 3.3, 3 says, which we just read, says you have died. Uh, then Galatians 2.20 says, Christ lives present tense in me. Ephesians 2.5 said, God made us alive. This idea of a new life now. God made us alive together with Christ. Colossians 3.3 3 says, your life is actually hidden with Christ in God. Colossians 3.4, when Christ, once again this astounding language, when Christ, who is your life? And then we go on, Ephesians mentioned that God raised us up with Christ. What in the world? Colossians 3, 1, if, which we just read. If then you have been raised up with Christ. And then more striking from Ephesians, God seated us, not only dead, not only made alive, not only raised up, not now, God seated us with Christ in the heavenly places. God created us in Christ Jesus for good works. When Christ appears, Colossians says, you will also appear with him in glory. And then in Ephesians 2, again, God plans more future. When he comes, God plans in the coming ages to show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us. In other words, the future forever, for eternity, we will be monuments to the grace of God. But Paul couldn't just put a period there. He's going to show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us. Guess what? In Christ Jesus. These are realities. This is not, I'll use my corny illustration. Paul is not playing some mind game here. This is not positive thinking. Uh, this is not like what this coffee company does. Chock full of nuts. I don't know if you drink it or not. It's actually not bad coffee. But if you open the can, you don't get nuts. <laughs> Listen to how they advertise on the back. In the 1920s, we sold nuts. In the 1930s, we sold nuts and coffee. Now, we don't sell nuts. We just sell coffee. But we like our name, <laughs> chock full of nuts. That's not, that's not what Paul is doing. He's speaking about realities. Admittedly, they are spiritual realities. But you did not, I think, I think we understand, you're, you're a well-trained congregation, you know that you, your sins are forgiven by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But that's still a spiritual truth from the Bible. You never got in the mail some sealed envelope, you know, return address heaven, and some certificate saying your sins are forgiven. It is a truth you believe based on the teaching of Scripture. What we are saying here is all through the Scriptures. One person studying this says there must be 160 references in Paul's lit, uh, letters about being in union, real spiritual union with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it's about. He said, when we trusted in Christ... Um, when we trusted into Christ, who was crucified for us, there's a sense in which we came to share in his crucifixion. United to Christ, all the implications of his being crucified for us become our possession. That's why Paul uses this death language. Death to the old man, death to the old, old style of life, death to the condemnation of the law, death to that penalty. When Christ rose, all the implications of his resurrection become my possession too, even if they're not worked out completely yet, such as our glorification in heaven. So in union with Christ, there is both a death for the Christian 
And yet there is the impartation of a new kind of life. Paul is saying, this is very important. Paul is saying this is not something we necessarily feel is true about ourselves. He is speaking about something God says is true about us. But that is also what the nature of, of many other doctrines are. So it's important to be believed and acted upon us, which leads me to speak. We're just going to speak about two things today, two main categories. I want to speak about faith and believing these things. Uh, and then the second main category is, so what? Uh, my concern from last week was we covered a lot of this ground, but I didn't really get to what are some practical ways this, this doctrine gets worked out in your life. So we're going to try to do that in uh, the time that remains. So, living by faith. What is faith? I love our, some of our statements in our confession and in our catechisms. In the confession it says this, by faith a Christian believes to be true whatever is revealed in the word for the authority of God himself speaking therein. And so that's, that is the real heart what is, the, what is true about someone who does not follow the Lord Jesus Christ? He is, he's not, he is living by faith, his own faith in whatever he's chosen to in place, uh, place his trust in. It's simply not the word of God, not the revealed doctrines of scripture. And so biblical saving faith is in its simplest form to believe whatever is revealed in the, in the word and it speaks on further. In other words, a person shows that by yielding obedience if he reads commands, trembling at the threatenings, embracing the promises of God for this life and that which is to come. And so that is, that is in essence what faith is and that's how we walk by faith as Paul mentioned in Galatians chapter 2.20. Um, this is interesting. This, uh, this relates to some secular uh, studies as well. I, um, in, in some of my studies, I ran across a person who had done some reading in, in Carol Dwick. She's a renowned social scientist, uh, not, a, not a Christian. But what's interesting, she wrote a bestseller in told, in, entitled Mindset, The New Psychology of Success. In it, she says, your mindset, that is the way you look at life, the way you interpret what is happening to you in life, your mindset is all about your beliefs. Your beliefs are the key to your happiness. She says she wrote her book out of the common concern for her students, most of whom assumed their mindsets were fixed. They couldn't change. They had a set of beliefs and they, they couldn't change those beliefs. She says, your mindset is all about your beliefs and your beliefs can change. She's saying something very similar to the Apostle Paul when he wrote in Romans 12 that we preached on, to have a mind that is transformed. And so by faith, we want to seize hold to these biblical truths of union with Christ and see where it leads us. Another illustration, I, um, I've told y'all that I've had cataract surgery. And uh, I talked to my doctor and I said, well, doctor, um, tell me what you do. Because they sedate you, of course. Somebody going to cut on your eyeball, They're, you better be sedated. Um, and so he said, uh, well, what we're going to do is you're going to lay on the table and I'm going to put a little incision in the top of your, each of your eye, you know, one at a time there. And uh, we'll go in and we'll take out that natural lens that was there. And he said, uh, you know that, uh, you know how you bring a roll of carpet into your house and you saw him think said you know you bring it in rolled up because that's how it gets through your door he says yeah that's what we're going to do we take this lens and it's rolled up and i'm going to put it through the incision i made and it'll unfold in your unroll in your eye and that's what he does and it sets in place and they take the patch off 24 hours later you're looking at someone who wore glasses for nearsighted since probably the fourth grade these two eyes see 2020 now. An astounding thing. 
And that's, that's, I, I'm saying that because that's what truth does. That's what faith does. Faith seizes, it believes on the, the promises and the statements, the doctrines of the word of God. And it gives us a new way of looking at life. And so that's really about all I want to say about faith at this point. Because what does faith then do in our lives? Let's move secondly to how does this language of being dead in Christ, raised with Christ, seated with Christ, what does that mean for this afternoon? What does it mean for the next week? And so let's talk about living by faith in union with Christ. Four things. First, if I'm going to believe myself, and I should, Believing myself to be united to Christ, I have greater stability in my Christian life. Every Christian here lives with very real conflict in his or her heart. And there are several reasons for this. We have an opponent, the devil, the evil one, Satan. He goes around as a roaring lion. He, one of his principal strategies is to tempt and to accuse and to slander and, and to deceive. He's real. We believe that. The scriptures teach that. He is there. There is a world system, again, that we spoke of in Romans chapter 12, in, in which we must live. It, you might say it has the aromas, the stench, the, the odors of a world system in opposition to God. And it's the, it's the world in which we raise our families, in which, we, in which we work, and it too exerts a pressure on us. And then, very importantly, there is still the presence of sin in us. We must always make the distinction, and we can, based on this teaching, we must always make the distinction between sin having dominion and rule and authority over us and its presence. Don't ever confuse those. But those three forces are at work and, and, how, and that conflict is very real and it can be very difficult and trying. And often we fail and sin. And sometimes we sin grievously. We know that sin in a, in a believer is no less a sin. It's no less a violation of the law of God than in an unbeliever. And the impact of that tension, that knowledge of what I should be and what I've done, what I've said, what I've left undone, uh, those things, uh, we, we are left with confusion. There's the temptation to doubt that we are saved at all. We are shaken. We fear to go to God in prayer. Um, we do not approve of what we've done, but we know God doesn't approve of it either and doubts in our mind. And we th those thoughts come, how can God use me? How could I have done that to her? How could I have failed so miserably? We believe that what God has said about our union with Christ is true. In Colossians, in those times, whose life do I have? Verse 4, I have Christ's life. Where is Christ? Christ is seated, verse 1, at the right hand of God. Where is my life? What an interesting word is used here in verse 3. Your life is, Paul uses the term, it's, it's hidden. It's like it has been placed there and covered up and sealed in the person and the life of the Lord Jesus himself, who, remember, is in heaven. This is great security. Now stop and think. What force can dissolve such a union and relationship like that? What earthly agencies can reach the throne room of heaven where Christ is? Let them fire all the atomic bombs in the universe. Nothing, nothing reaches there. Paul is trying to say your life is secure. It's completely secure because it is in union and hidden 
and in intimate communion with the life, the person of Jesus Christ himself. We had the opportunity not long ago to talk to the uh, Wednesday afternoon Bible study, and we did Psalm 2. Psalm 2 is that text, that psalm that starts out with the kings of the earth take their stand, the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his order. We're going to throw off his uh, bonds. We're going to break his chains. In other words, this, this great uh, uprising of all the nations of the world, they're going to threaten God. You remember how God responds? The Lord sits in heaven and he laughs at them. He scoffs at that. Paul is saying, your life is there. This is why we love Romans 8 so much, isn't it? Listen to how Romans 8 starts. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are, where? In Christ Jesus. You know how Romans 8 ends? I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God. Where? In Christ Jesus our Lord. It's all, th it's all through Paul's letter. So whether I'm at my lowest point in living the Christian faith, or my highest reach, my standing in Christ remains unchanged. Even though I have miserably sinned, and I do, cold of heart, going backwards, my relationship, my life is hidden in Christ. And so you see, if faith grabs hold of this, your security and stability as a Christian is enhanced. Okay, secondly, what's another application? Well, if I believe myself to be united to Christ, I have greater progress in my growth in holiness. These things are not contradictory. They actually build on one another. With the stability, now I, can, I have a sense that, uh, of growth and prospect in change. We're talking about that in our Sunday school class. Do you notice the line of thought in Colossians chapter 3? This is why I read on through chapter 11. Paul makes the statements. He says, this is who you are in Christ Jesus in these opening verses 1 through 4. And then he comes to us and gives imperatives, gives commands. Okay, person in Christ, now, with this kind of life, you have the ability to put to death, in actuality, aspects of your life. You have the ability to deal with passions and lust and covetousness and greed and manners of speech and all, all those kinds of things. You're setting your life on things above where Christ is. John Calvin says, we're going to seek. In other words, as a person in Christ, Calvin says, we seek those things that are above when in heart and spirit we are truly sojourners in this world and not bound to it. We're talking about our interests, our attitudes, our ambitions, our values, those, those things that guide and direct, that, that form that mindset through which we look at the world. There's this whole breadth, breadth and, and, and uh, spectrum of all of the things that are mentioned here. Putting to death that which is sinful and wrong. But putting on, Paul uses, it's basic, he, he really does, it's like getting dressed. You take off your pajamas and you put on your clothes for church. He says, put these, these sinful things off and you, in actuality, begin to live out the life of Christ that dwells within you. Paul believes that progress can really be made in your holiness of life. And the foundation of that progress is your union with Christ. The exhortations, the commands, the imperatives to be holy in Scripture are always delivered based on what God has already done for you. It was that way even in the Ten Commandments. You say, where is that? It's in the, the preamble to the Ten Commandments. I am the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. That's redemption. 
Redemption comes before the Ten Commandments. It's always that way in Scripture. What God has done for his people in Christ is the grand argument and incentive for Christian living. If I told you that the good news about living for Christ today is that you'll always lose, there are forces too great for you to resist, you'll spend each and every day of your life from now until you die in defeat. That's not much of a gospel, is it? And Paul is saying exactly the opposite. He's saying you are united to Christ. It involves power and ability and a way of seeing life. You can grow. Third thing, believing myself to be united to Christ, not only is there a greater stability in my Christian life, but there can be real progress against the sins that, that I still struggle with. There's real hope that this brings then. So thirdly then, I can experience greater communion with the Lord himself. We've been using the language of union with Christ. Uh, in our text, it talks about being hidden with him. And in other texts that I've referred to in John 15, you've got this speaking of a, a branch being in a vine. And Paul will say things in Philippians 3.8, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing not knowing about Christ Jesus, my Lord, or knowing the doctrine of Christ Jesus, my Lord. He knows those things, but he says, of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. John will write in 1 John, he says, we, the things we've seen and heard we proclaim to you so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. I'm not talking about mystical experiences or dreams or visions, but I think we can talk about holding real fellowship with the Lord, especially as he comes to us in his word. We don't look at our devotions. We should not look at our devotions as some kind of little check mark as we start the day. It's something that, okay, we've done that, put it aside, close the Bible, now off to the things that really matter. We must come to the word with no less a pur purpose than there that we might meet the Lord, that the Spirit would take this word and bring Christ home to, to our hearts to be strengthened in that kind of relationship. You know, we've, we've known these kind of things for centuries. Augustine is famous for the statement that he made Lord, you have formed us for thyself, and our hearts are restless, not until we read the Bible, but our hearts are restless until they find rest in thee. I think our Puritan forefathers knew this too. The first catechism question is, what is man's chief end? Once again, I think we know the answer, but I think we often just give half of it. We say man's chief end is to glorify God. And we tend to put a period there. But the Puritans didn't put a period there. Man's chief end is to glorify God and what? And to enjoy him. Doesn't the doctrine of union with Christ lead you to the hope and expectation of delight in God. Like those psalmists of old, Lord, like the deer, I pant for you. And this, this desire for real communion with God himself. Okay, fourthly, then, we've said a stability of life should come as we believingly understand these things. Uh, a growth in, in our own holiness. A, a deepening experience of Christ crucified for us. And the last thing, surely it means a greater unity within the body of Christ. Most of the, most of the statements in Colossians come as second person plurals. You know, you've been raised, do this, all of that. In other words, Paul is writing to a church. He's writing to a church in Christ. 
Up until this point, we've been stressing the individual's relationship to the Lord. But look at 3, verse 311. Chapter 3, verse 11. Look at how he ended this whole section. He says, there's not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised. He's certainly speaking about unity in the body of Christ. And he ends up by saying, but Christ is all and Christ is in all. And certainly the truth is then that if you have Christ in you as your principle, as your life, and I do too, shouldn't there be a communion at the horizontal level? Shouldn't there be a unity within the church? I believe in union with Christ that I, I should have then an attitude of love and care for other people of this congregation. We're gonna to seek to guard the unity of this congregation. We're not gonna take advantage of one another in this congregation. See, those things flow in practical ways out of believing that it's not just me that's united to Christ, but it's you too. And we're in this together as a church in Christ. You may not be completely here yet in terms of, of fleshing these things out, but I'm gonna close by simply saying would you please take your Bibles, read these texts, Galatians 2, Colossians 3, Romans 6, Romans 8. Prayerfully ask the Lord to write this mighty truth upon you that you would believe it and experience stability as a Christian, growth in holiness in your own personal life, deepening communion with the Lord himself and a united interest and love in one another in this church. Let's go to him in prayer. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for once again this opportunity to, to be fed from your word, to think about it. Lord, I'll be the first to, to say that these concepts are not easy, but they're there. We cannot deny it. They're in, our, in the Bible you've given us. Lord, our great prayer is that you will so write these truths upon our hearts that we will begin to live in the joy and in the confidence, in the fullness, in the battle against sin, for your glory, for our good. Lord, come to us. Give us even now great joy in the salvation you have accomplished for us in Christ Jesus our Lord. It is in his name we pray. Amen.